Uh, the Brown Bag Seminar Series that's concentrating on monitoring programs in the Delta uh, has been put together in an attempt to get a wide variety of, uh, of approaches and opinions about the monitoring that's being done in the Delta, largely to inform two reviews that the Delta Independent Science Board is doing. The first of these is on a review of the monitoring enterprise where, uh, process that's underway in the, in the Delta, which is, as you know, very extensive and very complex. Uh, and also a review of the IEP program. And so today's seminar really bridges both of these, where we'll be dealing with the, the uh, origins and the activities of the IEP, along with the fact that they are one of the major uh, groups that are in charge of monitoring uh, in the Delta. Uh, I'd like to introduce Steve. Uh, he is a title geomorphologist and he is the IEP lead scientist. So we can't think of anybody more appropriate uh, to have leading this discussion today. Uh, prior to this, he worked uh, for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, for the CalFed program, uh, and the Department of Water Resources. He brings uh, much experience from these different positions. Uh, he also has uh, did his graduate work at Davis with a master's in international agriculture and in PhD in ecology. Uh, one of the things that, of course, is most interesting in his background is the time that he spent in the Peace Corps in a variety of roles in uh, two very difficult postings, one in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the other in Gabon. So uh, we will have, uh, he has agreed to do comment, uh, listen to comments and answer questions afterwards, and we'll have a microphone that's set up there for uh, people to come up. Uh, also, copies of his PowerPoints are available. What we'll do is we'll follow this with a break of about 10 minutes, after which we'll start uh, by uh, introducing the panel that we have and some of the questions they're going to be dealing with. So, Steve, thank you. I can try to adjust the microphone a little bit. Will that suffice? Uh, thanks very much, Vince, and uh, to the ISB for the invitation. Uh, I speak to you uh, today on behalf of quite a number of people, I would say, into the hundreds. Uh, so uh, thank you to all of you for your contributions uh, within and among the IEP agencies. Uh, of course, anything that I get wrong today is uh, solely my fault, so you can blame me for that. Uh, a couple of things uh, as I begin. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to emphasize what I think of as uh, this talk being something of a narrative. So if, if you have questions, could, could you write them down and we'll get to them at the end. One of the things that I'm um, constantly struggling with, with with the IEP and with the interdigitation of these agencies in general is there's always a, a, a tendency to stop people in mid-sentence and, and, and quibble with something they've had to say. And I think that interrupts our ability to to, to describe what we do as a narrative that's actually to be enjoyed and celebrated. And you can ask questions about it at the end. But honestly, um, uh, I, I think that way, that sort of reductionist approach to taking issue with you know every little clause that someone has to say or every little piece of the science that we can take issue with is kind of getting in the way of our communications. And I think you'll find today that one of the emphases that we have uh, emerging this year, uh, and specifically for my agenda as we move forward uh, in the new year, is uh, an emphasis on science communications. So, so please, we, we welcome your questions. We want to get to them uh, in, in depth, but I think it might be best if we just uh, sort of wade through the whole thing here. And I'm planning on about an hour, so I better get going. Um, so please write your questions down, and hopefully we'll have a chance uh, to get to them at the end. So uh, the, the sort of title and theme of my uh, talk today is IEP Management Science, Theory, Practice, and Future. And as you might uh, guess, I've, I've broken the talk up into three main parts. Uh, the first is going to be some background on some of the organization. And yes, you will see an organizational chart. And no, there will be no quiz about that chart. But I, I have to go through some things that describe the, the program in general that um, you know, sort of uh, in many ways are ideal in nature. And um, you know, sort of your eyes may gloss over, at least briefly, uh, until we start talking about the real substance of the program. Um, and, and what I wanted to introduce there is there is a theory behind this. There are some structures that we thought about and some ways of articulating these agencies that we think are advantageous. But I will suggest right now that it is rarely the case that we sort of do that all according to plan. 
So then we'll move into a, a segment uh, that has three uh, examples, and that's the practice segment. Uh, I'm going to describe, and I, hopefully as I go, I'm going to move from the monitoring part to the decision-making part by sort of starting with a monitoring program that I'll deta detail in a, a little bit, and then move to uh, sort of a, a, an information accumulation and sharing piece uh, a little bit. And then the third example will be uh, uh, actually sort of how we put together our annual plan. And I hope that that makes sense to you. So we're going to move from monitoring to sort of informed decision making to actual program implementation. So, so that's what I have there on the practice part. And then the future bit, uh, hopefully I'll have time at the end. Uh, I've got myself allotted seven minutes or something for talking about the future. And that's where I think we could lay out a lot of the questions that we think the ISB can help us with and, and what I think is on our horizon uh, 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 and, uh, within the IEP. So there's your orientation. Um, one of the uh, things I like about um, uh, astrophysics and uh, celestial investigations is that they have really big equipment. And um, so this is a, 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 do any of you know what an LST is? Also, the cosmologists, they're really plain about their language. And LST, which you see depicted here on the slide, is a large size telescope. <laughs> um, and that's great because, you know, they investigate things like the Big Bang. Right. So um, I, I think if, if we can, you know, one of the things I like about this is that it uses simple language. But the real point here was I want to emphasize that my perspective, as I mentioned, you know, there are as many as 200 people involved or more in this enterprise. My perspective is just one perspective. And I represent something of an independent voice for the nine agencies that are involved in IEP. But just about everybody involved is likely to have a, a little bit different view on, on what is happening and, and how things should go. And I wanted to emphasize that I don't think you could ask any 10 people to describe the IEP and actually get the same sort of answer and, and uh, description. And, and, and to, to, to my view, that's OK. Uh, there's nothing wrong with people having a slightly different view of it. I hope that what you'll get out of this is uh, a description of places that we could help improve our communication and interaction. But I don't think that there's necessarily something necessarily wrong with, uh, you know, putting together a telescope that gives you a very accurate image, but that uh, puts it together using, you know, as many as a couple of hundred different pieces. So that's a struggle, right? I mean, trying to get that to go anywhere, uh, you know, herding of the cats, if you will, is, is hard. But I don't think it's necessarily wrong. So I wanted to start with that. My perspective is that. My perspective, and since it's my talk, that's what you're going to hear today. Hopefully informed by these other 200 people of which I speak. Uh, the other thing I wanted to make sure that I got to was uh, for the, the prospectus that I was handed for the, the review today, I wanted to make sure that I identified at least three things that I'm going to be addressing specifically in case I'm, I'm, I'm too vague about that. The first one is uh, in the review of this, how the science is using, how we're using the science now and how would it be used in the future. I mentioned it briefly. Uh, the IEP or the ISB asked about this, the use of uh, and creation of science narratives. And, and for me, that's, uh, uh, you're going to hear a little bit about that from the Bay Area of the base study example that I'm going to use. Uh, but it, for me, I've, I've uh, talked to the coordinating, uh, coordination team uh, recently. Uh, and, and one of the things that I'm um, going to try and, and try my hand at this year is creating some of the science narratives that come out of the, of the IEP work and some of the science that we do. So I specifically think that the IEP can be doing a better job. And I'm going to take a shot at, at, at an example or two of those in the coming year. The second thing was uh, the ability of the IEP to use ecosystem forecasting mechanisms uh, in its work. And I think we've got some very good examples that you're likely to be hearing about uh, as a community later this year. And they're coming out of the Delta Smelt scoping team. There's a, a very interesting combination of uh, uh, what I guess one could call hierarchical modeling, where we end up informing uh, some pro uh, uh, particle tracking uh, model software to, to get a, a handle on what we think uh, contributes to entrainment of Delta Smelt in particular at the federal and state water project facilities. And in my mind, if we do that well, and it looks like it's uh, coming, coming along nicely, uh, we, we could be entering into a world of, of ecosystem forecasting uh, soon. Uh, and so I, I wanted to mention that in case it's not clear that, that we're doing some of that. 
Another thing that the ISB has asked for is, is how are we supporting the management of water export facilities. The smelt working group example that I'm going to give you, which is example number two, I think, uh, when we get to the uh, practical part of the, of the talk, should hit on some of that. And then the last one is um, the effectiveness of the current institutional arrangements that support the interagency investment. And here I wanted to make a comment about, um, and, and, and this is, this is actually kind of surprising to me. Um, we've had a, a, some introspective um, uh, uh, coordination team uh, meetings where we've been describing to each other how we think the financing works behind the scenes of, of our IEP activities. And one of the things that we all took away from that exercise is just how remarkably fragile this arrangement is. And um, one of the things I think is common is that there's a certain um, tendency for people outside the IEP in particular, but even inside the IEP, to ascribe to it as, as a concrete and mortar character that, that, that is not true, that doesn't exist. Um, we play the role of a convenient punching bag for a lot of people, and the nine member agencies in turn also sometimes choose to blame certain things on the IEP depending on the subject of dissension or the current topic. But somehow, even though we don't have a real place and we're just an agreed upon group of interacting agents, we do provide improvements to agency science and scientists. And I firmly believe that the collective enterprise of an interagency ecological program are worth the investments and the frustrations. I hope to shine a light on what needs improvement, like uh, while I understand that I, uh, let's see, back up. I hope to shine a light on what needs improvement, but I hope you'll also understand that I've made a personal and professional commitment to this program by filling a leadership role in the IEP, and I'm trying to help guide the ship. I'm not trying to sink it, I'm not trying to run it to ground, and I'm not trying to keep it sailing along aimlessly forever. The science sausage-making factory that I know best of the IEP, I enthusiastically participate in, and I know everybody in that enterprise welcomes this review because it means better science, more meaningful, useful, estuarine understanding. I'll leave that there, because I think I'm already behind schedule. Not bad for part one. So, how are we organized anyway? Well, you get the org chart here. And um, I've toyed with cutting this apart into different versions uh, and going through trying to explain what's here. I, I don't think ultimately that's a useful strategy. Um, other than to suggest that there are four tiers of involvement with the interagency ecological program. We have the agency directors at the top who provide, um, I'll characterize as approval for what we send their way. Um, the coordination team, to me, is where the real interagency interactions occur. This is where the, project, uh, the program managers interact and decide, really, what their programmatic uh, imperatives are to be. Underneath that, you have program support team and science management team. That's really, in my mind, where the science sausage gets made. And uh, to be quite blunt and, and short about it, we're doing pretty well there. And I hope to be able to describe some of that to you as well. One of the other things that I think we're trying to improve our contact with is the bottom set of boxes, which are advisory groups and technical teams and uh, project work teams. Uh, I won't go into a whole lot of detail there, except to say that there are sort of uh, the, the core group are the three upper boxes, the directors, the coordinators, then science management team and science program support team. We have, you know, probably on the order of dozens of affiliated scientists who chair these project work teams. And while they may not attend every meeting that I go to, uh, they have their own meetings where they decide on their priorities. And then the idea is that that gets uh, funneled up to uh, the science management team and the coordinators. I think that's working well in some cases, and we need to make improvements in others. And, and so we can talk about that. Um, I'm going to get way behind now, I can tell. Uh, a little bit of uh, additional background before we move into my practice slides. And that is, I think it is useful to go back and look at the MOUs that have brought us all together. There are different ways I can describe what we are now, but I think it's interesting to pay a little bit of attention to what happened in to get us to where we are. And I'm going to go backwards through the memorandums. I've got a couple of the six or seven that are official. But it's useful to hear verbatim some of the language that's in those memoranda. 
This is from the 2016 uh, MOU. It's an amendment. So at some point, they decided to stop rewriting the MOU and just amend it. So this is actually an amendment. But th um, this is about partnerships. And, and um, two things are important in this document. This agreement in no way restricts the parties from participating in similar activities or arrangements with other public or private agencies, organizations, or individuals. You might have heard otherwise. Another interesting clause. The parties intend to work collaboratively and anticipate a need to share party resources to effectively implement IEP work plan elements. This may include the sharing of staff, equipment, space, and other resources where there is substantial involvement and mutual accrual of benefits by participants. Sounds pretty good. We will develop and regularly update procedures and policies collectively and individually as appropriate to preserve and facilitate timely exchange of information. This is uh, from a previous document, uh, 2000, the previous version, 2000, the year 2000. So the, pre the one I was just speaking from was 2016. This is two the year 2000. Um, some of this is getting into too much detail. I was going to talk a little bit about take. We can do that later. Um, so I'll skip that one. I'm now back to 1990. So 1990, the MOU in 1990, and this is important, this document, the MOU, this document will serve as the basis of authorization for future exchanges of funds, personnel, and equipment between the member agencies in the development and conduct of studies and required monitoring of the effects of federal and state projects on the San Francisco Bay Delta estuary. Actual exchanges will be made annually on a case-by-case -case basis as agreed to by the agency coordinators and agency directors and will be dependent upon available funding. So what I was getting at there is there's an agreement that this is a collaborative effort and that, that people are buying into the fact that we're going to need to rely on each other to do that, even though there is no real building or IEP in and of itself, right? But the agencies have agreed that the only way we're going to do this is collectively. And then lastly, um, I think, it, well, this will just sort of reinforce the point. Um, yeah, it's the same thing. I'm, I'm now looking at the 1971 memorandum and its reiteration of the same thing and its support for ecological studies in the San Joaquin, Sacramento San Joaquin estuary. So that's a little bit of background on the program. And then one more thing I wanted to say here, and then I, I, I wanted to ask, honestly, given some of the discussions that we've been having lately, and, and you know, maybe this is me wandering too far away from the science and into the political, but we have to do it because that's the landscape within which we operate. I, I made a note to myself a question. Uh, have we arrived at a socio-technical point in time to really re rethink how we administer jointly valued data collection, interpolation, synthesis, and reporting vis-a-vis -vis water project operations and the San Francisco estuary and its ecological character? So we've, we've, we've stated that this is a collective goal that we need to pursue. And somehow the review is asking, um, you know, how, how are we going to do this better? Is this necessary? Are there different ways of considering how we do this? I don't think there's any question that this is at least part of how we should do this. But I'm hearing and I'm seeing behaviors that would indicate that maybe people are consider considering alternative arrangements. And that's fine. But we should, we should do that uh, knowingly. And we should commit that by uh, commission rather than omission, if you will. Um, so now I'm going to cast the nets to the winds, if you will, and talk to you about three examples that I think begin to walk the, my, uh, my understanding and the, and the subject matter at hand from these basic understandings and organizations through sort of practical implementation. And then, as I mentioned, by the end, I hope we're getting to things like programmatic uh, decision making and, and annual plan uh, maintenance and uh, uh, construction. So uh, the first one is uh, uh, some, a, a program that's been uh, uh, sort of familiar to me for, for many years. Oh, now I'm, I forgot. There was a whole thing here. Let me check my time. One second. I may have decided to skip over way too much. Yeah, so um, 20 minutes. I'm going to... I was just about to skip over um, some details of the institutional arrangement that I think will be helpful, but I will no, by no means put to rest. And you're free to ask lots of questions about this later. Um, and that is uh, sort of 
you know, since we don't have a brick and mortar building that is IEP and nobody actually has a central IEP budget, like how do you guys put together your funding arrangements and how do you make those decisions? Um, well, through the structures that you've, that you've seen there, and I, you can ask questions about procedure, but what ends up happening at the end of each year is that uh, Greg and the program staff uh, sort of put together a list of, of funding priorities that have been made in the agencies and between the agencies, and our annual budget is a description of sort of what we do every year. And many people say, well, you know, how did you get there? Like, what did IEP do to get there? Like, what room did you sit in at the IEP building, which there isn't one, to make those decisions, which were made sometimes in consultation and sometimes not. And so, but we do track the budget. We, we can describe to people how much it is we spend, but it's not because uh, a central agency actually made single entity decisions about how that money gets spent. So I hope that's consistent with what I just described. Um, the details uh, are... are detailed and we'll skip them for now but uh, I wanted to give people at least a sense of the sort of the dollar amounts that we're talking about the major players in who spends money for IEP uh, uh, purposes and what it looks like you know in sort of standard uh, financial form uh, ways and 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 there's a reason they don't let me anywhere near the finances I'm a scientist right I, I this stuff is great I'm glad Greg knows how to do it but um, my description is gonna not do service to what's involved it's it's incredibly involved and a lot of the times by the program support team and Greg is spent trying to get their handle on what other agencies are doing in support of IEP uh, activities and so here you have it you know most of the money comes from DWR and the US Bureau of Reclamation there's a substantial uh, mo uh, minor input from CDFW there are some other people who contribute but we're talking if I added that up right we're talking on the on the uh, somewhere in the order of 33, 35 million dollars a year that gets spent on monitoring activities vis-a-vis -vis the, the impact of the state and federal water projects. Um, there, you can go through uh, different ways of slicing what this is and how it gets spent. I think you can quickly see that 71 plus 28 is 99 percent of it is compliance or compliance related spending. Um, we can describe how those things get characterized or categorized. I would like to acknowledge that uh, recently and increasingly there are uh, some inputs from sort of non-traditional IEP entities in this regard, including uh, some of the water contractors, uh, again, some state funds, and then uh, most recently uh, the science program and even the, the academic community. Um, these discussions about funding and monitoring occur in other places. That's one of the other things that I feel like I have become uh, comfortable with. I know in early days in the estuary when I was with DWR, and depending on how, who you talked to and how it was discussed, you sort of thought, well, maybe IEP is the be-all and end-all of monitoring in the estuary. Well, at least over my education and the t last 20 years, that, that's not the case. There's plenty of things that are going on beyond the IEP, and I think we're finally comfortable enough in our own skin that we can say, and that's okay. There's, there's places for people in this enterprise that don't necessarily involve, you know, that brick and mortar place of the IEP that I talk about all the time, you know, that doesn't exist. Um, even so, the, you don't have to be part of the MOU to be part of the community that does this. Uh, there are ways to, to look at the investments across uh, different sort of uh, um, uh, uh, subject matters, if you will, or organizational, you know, whether it's status and trends or modeling or pure research, which we don't do very much of these days because we don't have money. Um, here, uh, in case you're wondering, is um, a depiction uh, of the last three years, I think, and where the bulk of our directed studies money, so any additional monies beyond the routine ongoing monitoring programs, uh, this is a slide depicting uh, where those have gone, and in case, you know, if you're interested, we can go into the details of that as well. Um, again, another different slice at it. You can look at it by various species, um, and all of this is something that Greg spends a considerable amount of time, and his counterparts at DWR, the Bureau, and uh, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service spend a lot of time sort of tracking that. It's a, it's a significant input of time. So, so that's that. So 
now I'm back where I thought I was and trying to m now take a walk from what I think I just finished, which was a sort of conceptual, basic, uh, underlying arrangement of, of entities uh, through uh, what do we actually do in the field and how does that ultimately work its way up to management uh, inputs. And I'm going to do that uh, three ways. And they're going to get increasingly management oriented. This one's going to start out um, fairly monitoring oriented, but it should work its way towards management if I'm, if I'm at all good and if I remember what I put on the slide. And special thanks to um, Marty Gingras and his staff at the U.S. Uh, at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for the background on this. I learned a lot uh, soliciting materials from those 200 people I mentioned before. Uh, whether or not I actually am going to retain it all is a different matter, but I'll try to give it to you today as best I can. So this is the Bay Study. You may have heard about it. Um, it was established in uh, 1980. It, it, it takes uh, monthly samples uh, f along the axis of the estuary in a variety of locations. It's one of the only studies that we have that sort of gets its way all the way from the interior delta all the way down to the South Bay, which is uh, interesting. Um, uh, it's uh, founded, one of the founding documents that Kathy Heeb shared with me was the, it's the uh, study of delta freshwater flow, the needs of the San Francisco Bay ecosystem. And the figure one in that document is what I'm showing here, and interestingly, even you know, in such ancient time as 1980, there were people who were taking a, a, a whack at sort of what they thought the implications were for a water project and, and water uh, uh, extraction from the estuary. And you know, if you just think about the volume of water under those curves and how the volume left in the estuary over time has diminished, um, you know, I'm not saying that there's a causal relationship between these things, but boy, you know, my simplistic ecological mind says, hmm, there's been some change here and and um, you know I, I get that people are holding our feet to the fire when we try to describe what those changes actually are and to ascribe responsibility for them and causation to them I get that that's science but I, I don't think that this figure should go unheeded as something that people were thinking about even at the inception of the the Bay program the Bay study uh, so what the Bay study does when it goes around all those uh, um, uh, dots on the map that you saw earlier is 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 deploy two sets of gear. Um, the first is an otter trawl, and uh, some of you may be familiar with the fact that the otter trawl drags on the bottom or as close to the bottom as you can get it without getting it snagged all the time. So you're sampling sort of the bottom of the water column. Uh, uh, granted, the, the net has to be lowered and brought back up, so you're going to get some of those fish. And then at the same time, they do a midwater trawl, and uh, I know this is adapted from uh, Jeremiah Bautista's uh, uh, wonderful slide showing uh, how this gear is deployed and retrieved. Uh, but uh, the idea here is that you're also sampling uh, in, the, in the middle of the water column. And then some, some stats that Jeremiah shared with me that are, are just sort of give you a characterization of, of what such a monitoring program does in a year. Uh, this was for 2015. 71 species. So that's one of the other points that I hope we can remember to think about here is that even though we may be here because people are driving home the needs for delta smelt and longfin smelt and the listed species, um, many of these programs and my own ecological thinking is really thinking about everything else that's in the estuary as well. So when we're talking about, like, what are the needs of the IEP monitoring program, those discussions tend to be dominated by the listed species, and I get that. But as an ecologist and as a monitoring program that was devised to uh, examine the impact of water project operations on the entire estuary, I think we have to acknowledge that there are 71 other species out there that are that we're collecting information on, that people are beginning to make understandings about. Uh, 117,000 fish, lots of anchovies. Uh, uh, so this is not only fish, it's crabs and shrimp. And of course, the water quality sort of comes along uh, by default. I don't want to give that short shrift, but I have learned over my time as a f ecologist that the fisheries work seems to be a lot harder than some of the water quality work. And I know I'll get booze immediately as though I say that. But, but anyway, uh, I, I, I kind of pine for an automated sensor that I can drop in the water and get information back on it. And again, boos are welcome. You can say, no, that's not why. But anyway, uh, the, the fish part's really hard, and, and of course, but the equally valuable is the water quality work. I mean, we know so much about what's going on of, for water quality reasons because these people started to monitor water quality at all those stations monthly, you know, 40 years ago, 37 years ago. 
Um, let's see. Uh, one of the uses of the Bay study, which I'm not sure they had on their minds when they uh, conceptualized it, uh, but it has been useful for this purpose, is the identification of invasive species. We've got the Shimofuri and Shokahazi gobies. We've got mitten crabs that were first discovered by the Bay study, uh, Exopaleomon modestus, um, and I suspect that uh, there may be more on the horizon. I guess some of these, sh these are going to be now beyond my uh, personal experience, but some of the shrimp species that we're encountering now are, are sort of, you could point to the Bay study as the place where we discovered that those were, were, were arriving if you will. Um, I wanted to mention that it is one of uh, the only programs that, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, extends beyond sort of mid-bay, if you will, mid-estuary, mid if you will. It goes beyond uh, San Pablo Bay into the, into the south and, uh, central and south bays. Um, I'm not going to have time to go through that. And then one of the last things that the, the staff at, at, at the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, have impressed me with, and I've visited the lab several times now, is, um, you know, all of those thousands of fish, nearly 100,000 fish, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, from 2015, they have to be identified, counted, and sorted, and sampled, and stored. And there are people whose lives are spent doing that. And sometimes we don't necessarily acknowledge the expertise that we're sitting on. This is a world-class fish and invertebrate identification lab in uh, Stockton. And when people say things like, well, you know, the IEP needs to add these other things, and here's all the stuff you need to be doing. Like, are we thinking really about training the people who need to staff these labs? Because it takes years for these people to get good at what they do. And when people say, well, I, I can collect these samples, and that lab can turn it around in 48 hours, well, those are really, 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 really trained people who are told to turn those around in 48 hours. If you have to bring new people on, it can take years to get them up to speed, and the turnaround times are going to get much longer than that. So your ask of such a lab, and such a program need to be scaled to that. And that's one of the things that I think an improved communication and uh, articulation at the level of the MOUs that we discussed earlier and that I think the ISB might be considering giving us some advice on should, should take that into account. Um, so there's one last thing I wanted to do with the base study stuff in case you weren't impressed is run through a list of titles of things that um, they've published over the years. And I'm not going to go through all of them. It's like an impossibly long list. Um, but I think uh, if I did my job right, you're going to be impressed. I, w I am. Split tail contributions. Mang and Moyle, 1995. Status of split tail in Sacramento, Sacramento and San Joaquin estuary. Summer Baxter and Herbold. Resilience of split tail in the Sacramento San Joaquin estuary. Smelts, Moyle, Herbold, Stevens, Miller, life history and status of Delta smelt in the Sacramento San Joaquin estuary. Rosenfield, Baxter, 2007, population dynamics and distribution patterns of long fin smelt in the San Francisco estuary. Mertz, Hamilton, Bergman, Cavallo, spatial perspective for Delta smelt, a summary of contemporary survey data. Mers, Bergman, Meg Melgo, Hamilton, long fin smelt, spatial dynamics and ontogeny in San Francisco estuary. Nobriga, Rosenfeld, population dynamics of long fin smelt in the San Francisco estuary, disaggregating forces driving long-term decline of an estuarine forest fish. Beaver, McWilliams, Herbold, Brown, Fiber, linking hydrodynamic complexity to delta smelt distribution in the San Francisco estuary. For striped bass, Kimmerer, Cowan, Miller, Rose, analysis of an estuarine striped bass population, influence of density-dependent mortality between metamorphosis and recruitment. Summer, Mejia, Hebe, uh, Baxter, Lobachevsky, and Logi, long-term shifts in the lateral distribution of age zero striped bass in the San Francisco estuary. Jasby, Kimmerer, Monosmith, Armour, Klern, Powell, Schubel, and Vendlinsky, isohaline position as habitat indicator for estuarine populations. You know that X2 thing? Kimmerer, t effects of freshwater flow on the abundance of estuarine organisms, physical effects, or trophic linkages. Kimmerer, Gross, McWilliams, is the response of estuarine nectin to freshwater flow in the San Francisco estuary explained by variation in habitat volume. Uh, I could, I am going to go on. Uh, Baxter, Brewer, Brown, Chikowski, Fiber, Gingras, Herbold, Mueller, Solger, Nobriga, Summer, Souza, Pelagic Organism Decline Progress Report. Kimmerer, 2006, response of anchovies dampens the effects of an invasive bivalve. Fiber, Clern, Brown, Fish, Hebe, and Baxter, estuarine fish communities respond to climate variability over both river and ocean basins. Right? Pretty impressive group here. 
Um, it's almost impossible to list all the EIRs, the plans, reviews, and other gray literature that's used in the base study data, that has used base study data. The long-term management uh, study uh, or strategy for dredge disposal and dredge windows, Bay Bridge construction and demolition, San Francisco airport expansion, tidal marsh restoration, the salt by salt ponds in particular, sand mining, Costco Busan spill, shell oil spill. The data has contributed to surf perch recreational and bay shrimp commercial fishing regulation and Pacific herring commercial fisheries model for the San Francisco Bay Delta, or San Francisco Bay. So amazing, amazing survey, right? And it was because people got together and said, what are the projects doing to the estuary? Um, one of the most important papers, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it off here because I really don't have time to it, is the Jim Clern paper. He did this with, with Kathy Heeb and a list of others. But the data set is clearly shown here. And you can see that we developed a notion of how decadal oscillations in the coastal ocean and the estuary have affected the resources of the estuary over time. And it's because we collect data like the Bay Study data that we get to put pictures like this together. And I don't think that can be under uh, sorry, overemphasized. It's a really big deal. I wish I had more time to go into it. I'm going to move to my next example. This is more clearly water project focused. It will feature the fall midwater trawl and the environmental or the enhanced delta smelt monitoring. And I think I'm doing okay on time here. So the genesis of the fall midwater trawl was um, to measure the abundance and distribution of age zero striped bass, and that was in 1967. Most recently, uh, it's been mandated by the Delta Smelt Biological Opinion for the combined operations of the Central Valley Project and the State Water Projects. So there was a genesis for this study. People were doing it because they thought it was important to look at the impact of the projects on striped bass. And then it's gone along over time. And then at least as recently as 2008, and I'm sure before that, but at least as, as written in the Federal Register in 2008, it's a requirement now. Because people said, hey, we can tell something about the Delta Smelt in that survey. At least that what I thought would have happened. Oh, incidentally, one, one observation I wanted to make as I go on. That base study that I talked to you about uh, in terms of annual budget from the IEP contributing agencies, about 4 or 5 percent of the annual budget. Um, So the fall midwater trawl, uh, it's, has, it's gone through some expansions. There are definitely problems with it. We know that it doesn't sample the shallows well. And so you've heard lots of people say, well, it's a completely ridiculous sampling mechanism for delta smelt because it doesn't sample the shallows. Mm, yeah, we, we know that. It's a big net. It's hard to deploy in the shallows. We get that. But I don't think that that means that it's not a good sampling device, particularly if you're looking at it over time. Again, I'd be willing to listen to other people's input on that. I think one of the challenges for the fall midwater trawl and the, uh, is the fact that it was tied to an index that needed to be made every year. And that index that needs to be made every year impacts people's ability to use water in the system. So rather than assail the index, or the fact that we need more information about fish in the shallows, we tend to just say, well, the fall midwater trawl is not what we need it to be, or isn't what we tell people it is, or something like that. So it really is to measure the abundance and distribution of selected fish species, pelagic fish species in the estuary. It's to gain an understanding of the factors affecting abundance and distribution of those fish species, to provide a baseline uh, data set to evaluate management plans and habitat restoration projects, and to measure the availability of fall plankton food resources at least since 2010. So how does that work to this notion of um, informing the management directives. Well, as I said, there is a, an index that is made that's used to track uh, the abundance of the species and to uh, help calculate how much incidental take the projects can have before restrictions kick in. And, and so that data, the, the fall midwater draw, trawl data that I described, uh, shows up like this. And these are, this is directly from uh, D Department of Fish and Wildlife memos, the, the most recent one dated uh, December 21st of last year. It tells you about the, the abundance according to that survey. Uh, these are um, 
let's see, uh, their monthly surveys September through December. Uh, they do oblique midwater trawls at each of 100 stations and they make this calculation of the index. And so here are examples with the inset figure being the most recent five years. Again, you know, the recent insets could show you some pretty dramatic ups and downs, but I think it's useful that if you look at that across the entirety of that data set, um, we're really talking about some pretty small movement of those bars compared to what was here when we started uh, um, monitoring. And, and again, I'm not ascribing, you know, causality here. I'm just saying that the management um, monitoring objectives that people put out there for themselves in the 1960s and 70s allow us to know where we are in 2017. And so calls for like it's not relevant anymore, which I hear are, are puzzling to me. So I wanted the, I wanted the review board to understand that these are some of the discussions that we have. And in some cases, uh, American Shad last year, you know, did, did really well, you know, and I, I don't, I don't want to stand up here and describe why that may or may not be the case, but we have a survey that tells us that for whatever reason, that species responded well in what was a recordly wet year, if that's good English. So, um, I think there was a realization that, um, uh, the fall midwater trawl was doing certain things, but that there were additional information needs as well. And we knew this because we had done some work uh, in the wintertime in particular, winter and spring, with a, a different type of gear. And this is the uh, spring Kodiak trawl. And, and this is a quite a different setup. You'll notice that it's a net towed between two boats, and it's a, it's a big net. And I, I gather a little bit unwieldy, but people figured out how to use it. Again, you're not sort of sampling the shallows with something like this. And we know that, and there are uh, efforts afoot in our current annual plan to, to sample the shallows more effectively. But again, I don't think it, it puts into question uh, these indexes that we've derived over time. Uh, it should uh, provide us additional information. I'm not sure it's going to tell us that we were wrong all those years, but, but, you know, as a scientist, you know, somebody occasionally can tell us we're wrong. That's okay. So anyway, picture of the, of the gear there. This particular uh, uh, sampling uh, uh, genesis was from uh, the early warning system that you may have heard about. That people were particularly interested in, in finding out, is there a way to detect smelt Delta smelt on the way to the pumps early enough that we could ramp down pumping and not entrain them, but not so early that we forego, you know, otherwise uh, pumping water that didn't have any fish in it, for example. Again, thinking that the only fish in the water would be delta smelt, of course. Um, uh, there was a, uh, an also a, an express need by the Fish and Wildlife Service, some, some very talented modelers who said, you know, if we could get some of this data a little more frequently, it would really inform our life cycle modeling needs. And then, uh, again, most recently, and this was uh, from uh, just over a year ago, the WIN Act, uh, it's actually required that we do more. Uh, I'm not sure that this particular study was outlined uh, except to say that uh, we need increased monitoring and distribution studies. So that was used as uh, a way to describe the purpose and need for the uh, 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 enhanced delta smelt monitoring of which this, this net and, and this gear is now uh, a, a part. Uh, so, you know, these are ascribed to various uh, sample areas and uh, it's informing a number of things, uh, including some risk management models and some predictions about when you need to ramp down pumping. And I think it really has improved the statistical validity of the samples themselves. Um, again, we're, I wanted to show you that, uh, you know, you've really, oh, and I forgot the last one. So remember that, uh, uh, um, I keep forgetting the numbers. The, uh, the last study I described, uh, so the fall midwater trawl, we're talking 1.5 to 2% of the annual budget. So now with the EDSM, you're going out and you're sampling much more frequently, uh, uh, in fact, at times um, daily, as I recall, um, over a longer period of time in the year. And I wanted to show you again the picture of the, uh, the slide of the, uh, of the lab crews. You, you're really generating a lot of samples now. And somebody has to, you know, ID and archive and store and all of that. So kudos there. It's a real challenge for us. Um, I will say that it also has required an increase in uh, resources, and I think my notes uh, suggest that the early, the enhanced delta smelt monitoring work is now uh, 10 to 12 percent of our annual budget. 
just for comparison purposes to those other studies. So what happens to that data, which is kind of now my transition to sort of walking this over to the Uh, to the analytical needs and the information needs of the decision makers. Um, in my experience, well, it gets used in a lot of different places, but the one I wanted to point out for you today was um, the SMELT working group. Uh, so that data, the, the EDSM data is available uh, weekly. Uh, very good summaries. Uh, you can click on, on any number of these links. They, they work very hard to get that data out quickly, and it's, it's QA, QC, but again, it, it places tremendous burden on the infrastructure that we have at IEP, and I, I would like to have us discuss ideas you might have for, you know, how we might better manage that and, and provide for that. Um, so, you know, as this information gets collected, like where does it go and what do people do with it? Well, the first thing I'll point out is that you guys have probably already been involved in reviews of these long-term operations. The Logo Review discusses some of this uh, on a biannual basis now, I believe. But there's also annual uh, transaction reports that come out describing how the Smelt Working Group provides its recommendations to the water operations people and how they make recommendations to the Fish and Wildlife Service for administration of the BOs. Uh, so that's available here and and in links. Uh, the specific components that the smelt working group speaks to are usually, uh, well, in this case, in this example, are um, migrating pre-spawning adults uh, and their larvae and, and maybe early juveniles. So we're talking about the, the winter time and, and early spring here. And that really seems to be uh, where um, we can have um, effective actions taking, taken that would uh, diminish the entrainment of Delta smelt into the, the water projects in and of themselves. Now what I will say as a working scientist in an estuary is that you know, that's not the only life stage that we uh, think about and that's not the only way Delta to smelt and other fish can die. So we always need to keep that in mind. This is just a piece of the overall puzzle. And um, to my mind, as an ecologist and as an estuarine geomorphologist, as Vince mentioned, um, it certainly would be better in my mind if we were able to think about these things as an estuary a little bit more than we are. But nonetheless, we have to fulfill these, these uh, regulatory mandates. And so that's what tends to get talked about particularly if we're willing to be reductionist about it. So anyway, here's a slide that shows you that the smelter collected, information about the smelter collected all year round. Uh, I mentioned before the fall midwater trawl, which is in the upper right hand, that sort of focuses on the September to December period. Um, but the enhanced delta smelt monitoring that I just described is, is an attempt to make that year round and to really intensify and to stratify and randomize how we collect that information to make it more statistically robust. And I think it does. But again, I have to call attention to the fact that it, it requires considerable additional resources. And then just as a comparison, if you wanted to say, well, was that a good choice for how we deploy resources in the IEP, um, this is the fall midwater trawl index in the black overlaid with what we can deduce thus far with the Kodiak gear. This isn't necessarily the enhanced delta smelt monitoring program, but it shows you what the um, uh, different gear is. And, and what it is sampling, and I think it, you'd be hard pressed to say that there was a whole lot of additional information provided, at least from this comparison. And all I wanted to point out there was that we are learning things through EDSM, of course, but you know we have to sort of begin to think about what are we spending our resources on, and how much additional expenditure are we willing to give for similar information? We could use help with that, and I think a, a a, a, some attention to the arrangement of how these discussions occur could, could benefit us. So again, um, this is a, a, these are data traces for the kinds of information that are fed to the smelt working group. And I haven't done a very good job of describing where we are now with that. So um, this group meets weekly during the smelt entrainment season, which is roughly the winter time once it starts raining. Uh, and they try to take this field information that IEP is mandated to collect and make some, uh, make some policy relevant uh, decisions about when to restrict pumping or when it's okay to continue pumping, uh, identify what the risks are to the fish, do they have the kind of conditions that they need to survive in other parts of the estuary, when do we pump, when should we not pump, where are the fish moving, why are they moving. And so the information that I'm describing that comes from the Bay study originally, but now so from the EDSM and from the 
the fall midwater trawl, that's this information and this gets fed to a group of people who advise the Fish and Wildlife Service on sort of what its policy decisions are, what its operational recommendations to the operators are. So um, again, relying on colleagues from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, some of you may have seen this at last year's IEP workshop. Uh, Mike Eakin and Chad Dibble in particular have helped me put together this uh, so that I can be cogent uh, using their descriptions uh, where mine maybe aren't. Uh, so a little bit of a review, but in case I've, I've, I've not made it clear, um, our role is to use these long-term monitoring programs as part of the weekly synthesis of data that gets to the smelt working group. And they include the studies that you see here. Um, the surveys take uh, generally a week or more each to conduct. Uh, however, once the data, once the fish get collected and uh, identified, that data it can be disseminated fairly quickly to the people who need it. Uh, let's see. Uh, depending on the number of fish that are encountered, you can either tell people about it immediately or wait and give a summary at the end of the week. So that's going, there's some uh, uh, assessment of, of what's going on there before these are moved uh, into the decision-making process. And then at, at the very least, these things uh, occur on about a weekly basis. So you go out and you do the surveys and within a week you can tell people what you've encountered in the field and then it's up to them to decide what that information means. And this speaks to this, you know, the, the WINAX, you know, you know, desire to, 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 to add uh, more intense and including distribution information, well, this is the kind of information that the fall midwater trawl has been generating for a, a long time. So again, how, how did we achieve the balance that we have? Again, just a description for that. Um, so, you know, we acknowledge that the monthly sampling that the fall midwater trawl has been doing might not be the best to um, uh, provide information for the, for the need to provide weekly inputs to the operators. So, so that's been an improvement. Um, again, what does the raw catch data mean? You know, there needs to be some assessment of when you encounter one fish, does that mean one fish? When you encounter 400 fish, does that mean you've just caught every fish in the estuary? So it's not just as simple as conveying the numbers ahead. And then we'll talk about um, some of the other issues uh, that, that are well on my mind when you begin to, to look more closely at how this information is collected and disseminated. And coming down the home stretch here. So that leads me to these things, the couple things that I've been pointing out along the way. Where does our mandate go? Uh, should we concern ourselves solely with listed species? Should we think more and more about feeding guilds? Are we really interested in the monitoring program that informs us about the Bay Delta ecosystem? Are we talking about management and analysis and assessment of the entire San Francisco estuary? And in my mind, this is, you know, from an estuarine ecology point of view, have we lost the estuarine thread? Are we focusing so much on the smelts and water project operations that we're missing a lot of the other things that are actually, you know, leading to the demise of many of these fishes? So um, that leads us to what does IEP put together annually as a group of agencies in its annual work plan? And my apologies to Alan Bullock here for those of you who know his study in tyranny. Uh, we may just be talking about a study in tyranny, but in any event, we do it every year. We put together an annual work plan that is basically a reflection of what the agencies have decided, our priorities for spending for any particular given year. We do it a year in advance. We have uh, specifications for timelines and, and, and requirements for you know, information needs and evaluation um, that I suppose we could go into um, if you want. I think you've already reviewed many of those documents before. It, it follows uh, a sort of generally agreed upon principles and it builds on some of our program and program documentation including our strategic plan the science strategy which we're now launching on an update of this coming year so prescient and well timed because impact or input that you might have on your review of the institutional arrangements can be reflected in our review in our update of the science strategy which is going on now and then what's depicted here is that we build the work plan through a series of uh, meetings and discussions at the coordinators and, and uh, uh, science management team and then we basically make recommendations to the directors who approve it. Um, we think, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, so I basically just outlined that. Uh, I did want to emphasize that there are uh, published calendars for how this occurs, 
And yet, um, even though we've got MOUs that identify the nine agencies and the roles and responsibilities of those nine agencies, and even though we publish and have now uh, gone through uh, a, a set calendar for how we do this twice, there always seems to be uh, several items that don't conform to anybody's calendar and that really challenge the working relationships between uh, all of the IEP working agencies. And that's largely because uh, either one or several agencies uh, you know, have a new imperative forced upon them that they have to come to the management and monitoring enterprise and say, you know, we've got a new priority this year and we think you guys sh should be responsible for doing it. And we're happy that people are coming to us with that. We do think we have the expertise to conduct most of those studies and to make sense of the information that we collect. But it often comes without due consideration of the resources that are needed to add that to the list. And I'll get to a slide at the end here where you'll, I hope you'll be impressed with the things that keep getting added to the list, but the roster of people who are responsible for this doesn't really get all that much longer. So you've got more and more things for the same amount of people to do with less and less resources. And as I mentioned, you're generating more and more samples and like who's, who's mining the mint, right? For those of you who know the late 60s movie. Um, so this was just a, an illustration of the calendar that we use. Um, this is an illustration of the number of people involved uh, to, who put together uh, you know, the annual plan and it's a considerable pool of talent and expertise and I'm very proud to be part of that group. I just um, would love in, in my life if we could do it without such a severe limitation of resources just once. It would be really great. But um, you've probably heard enough about that. So uh, this past year, here's a list of the directed studies. You can ask for details about what each of these mean and how they uh, improve our monitoring enterprise and how they will improve the information stream that we give to the, to the decision makers. We, we think it's an improvement. Every year we think it's a, a, at least a, an incremental improvement. Um, and we wanted to point out that uh, a, a real highlight of the arrangement thus far, and again, this is uh, sort of me having been through this now the first time, one full cycle, uh, there's a really um, uh, comprehensive, uh, that's not the right word, a, a, a really um, effective uh, strategy of review that occurs before things get into the IEP work plan. And it really points out how, in spite of all the various uh, challenges that I've been describing, we actually managed to get a lot of things done, and it's actually working pretty well. There's an administrative review to make sure that things are you know, in and all of the elements are there. There's a science management team review that focuses on rigorous, efficient, effective science. There's a coordinator's review at the level of the program managers that decides is it relevant for their purposes and is it coordinated to the extent possible. And then finally, the directors give an approval on that. Um, Again, we can talk about that. And, and, and before everyone say, well, you know, Steve, you've been talking about many of the challenges. Um, you know, why don't you point out many of the successes? Well, I, I'm having a real struggle pointing out the successes. And it's one of the things I want to do this year uh, uh, very directedly. Uh, this is the first three pages of, I think, something on the order of an 11-page uh, bibliography. These are papers that were published either with or among or for or using IEP data in 2017, roughly. Uh, it's 50 published manuscripts. I think if you think about that in terms of, you know, how much did that cost? I don't know, $100,000 might buy you a manuscript if you were to, you know, go to a competitive uh, grant process. So that's $5 million of publications. I struggle to find a director who knows much about any of those papers. They don't hear it from us. They don't hear it from me. They don't ask. They hear it from other people. And I think that's one of the things that we'd like the independent review board's input on is how can we make a more cogent and effective science message? I think it starts with describing what's in these papers in languages and, and terms that, that directors will understand. And that's one of the things that I'm going to put for myself in the coming year. But I think we could use some help in, in, in thinking about that. Again, I think it's a really impressive set of things from a group of people who really don't have any place together and who don't have a brick and mortar, but who have a, an agreement that combined and collaborative estuarine science is the way to do business. Uh, I think that's to be celebrated. We don't do that enough. We look pretty good. So what's next? Um, and I'm down to my last two minutes, and I think I'm going to make it. Um, I 
I think even our harshest critics have to agree that we're improving our monitoring, analysis, and synthesis. So how can we continue this progress? Do we quicken the pace? Do we avoid, can we avoid the occasional cross-communication and miscommunication? Um, as I mentioned, I think we're really working on the science communication pieces now. But the enterprise, the, the universe of mandates that we're going to have to satisfy information needs for is going to expand. And that's uh, this slide. There's, there's a lot of pieces that are going to continue and come online needing information from the estuary in, and from sampling programs of the kind that the IEP is good at. But does that mean the IEP should do all of them? Or does that mean that we'll have the resources to do all of them? Um, I don't know. Um, this is a slide I mentioned earlier, you know, starting with uh, some of our earliest studies in the, in the late 50s. Uh, you'll see the Bay study coming online in 1980. You know, we, we, we seem to be adding information to the stream all the time, and it's gotten to be quite a mountain of information, if you will. But our ability to store that information, to exchange it properly, to understand what's in it, may not be what it should be or could be if we had uh, institutional arrangements that facilitated that kind of thing. And again, I think that's a, a subject for you, your review. Um, other challenges that we're going to face, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure any of us, and I'm looking around the room at, at, at some of the friends I've seen here the longest, you know, we've been confronting this rare species thing for a long time. It, it's not going to get any easier. And yet the demands on getting the answers that we need, you know, they, they, they keep coming harder and faster every year. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, maybe we're on the verge of a breakthrough with tagging that might occur with Delta smelt soon. Maybe, hopefully. That would be a real improvement, I think. Um, what about the big deal changes that are happening in the estuary that we're only just starting to talk about. What are the real changes to our infrastructure and data collection regimes going to be? And where are those discussions happening interagently? We're starting to have them at IEP, but are people going to stay at IEP and have those discussions if they involve lots more money and lots more expertise? So where are we? Uh, this is for Vince. He, he mentioned my Peace Corps work. Um, this is uh, the Bene Kalundwe in southeastern Congo, and every year they have a Chianza ceremony. And uh, I guess we call it Kwanza here. Uh, it's not exactly the same thing, but I was lucky enough to be invited along one year. And you go there, and uh, the chief has a week to sit and listen to complaints from everybody involved and uh, you know, tell them the stories of the things that have been happening to the, over the last year. And, and then um, he gets uh, like a final day where he feeds everybody and tells them what his plan of action is for the next year. And then they either, you know, run him out of town or, or, or re-anoint him. <laughs> and, and then they have a big meal and they break all the dishes and they go home and they do what they had said they were going to do for the year. So, I, you know, I kind of feel like at the end of my first year here uh, at, at the uh, leadership of the IS, or the uh, IEP and the science program, I sort of feel like this is what I'm presenting to you here. Um, we've, we've got some programmatic problems and communication problems and the arrangements and the financing. You know, they're not, they're not everything they could be or, or, or maybe should be, but they are what we have. So do we, you know, try to make use of what we got or do we break all the pots and go our separate ways? And I've heard, I've heard opinions, uh, you know, both ways that no, we, we can make tweaks and we can make this work. I've heard people say, yeah, you know, it's not, not working for us. And, and I, think, I think we're at an important point. The last thing I'll say is, is this, and I, and I wrote it down, and I, and I hope I'm not going to get in trouble for it, but there's a reason I wrote it down, because I do feel strongly about it, and I'll end, I'll end with this. Success and promotion for individuals involved with the IEP comes from within their specific agencies. Promotion of individual agency agenda and positions vis-a-vis -vis San Francisco Estuary Science is um, incentivized above supporting the IEP collective. This has been the case for a while now, but the idea of shared resources and expertise was the foundation of the program and has on occasion been remarkably successful at doing just those things. And I could point out the pod, the flash, the 40 to 70 pre-reviewed publications per year, et cetera. Of particular note and concern now is the individual pursuit of specific agency, project, consultant, or management objective by whomever holds sway in whatever initiative or conversation happens to be catching key agency directors' attention on any given day. 
Fortunately for me and for my personal objectives, we still need science and we still need data and we need help interpreting what the science can say to managers. And note, I didn't say what the science means. I mean, what's the science, what can the science say to managers? Pulling qualified scientists out of their managing agencies to perform quality informed data collection should be the goal and we need to find a mechanism to promote program managers who enable, encourage, and celebrate the collaborative community science. I welcome the ISB's review and recommendation in this regard. Our IEP science has never been more relevant, more necessary, and more fragile, and more subject to fragmentation by our body politic. So with that, um, let me close my remarks and thank you for your time and attention. As always, thanks so much, Steve. It was for us trying to wrap our heads around, especially us from outside the region. I've been aware of IEP for 25 years or more, um, and seeing how it's working and hearing sort of the from the inside what's going on with warts and with accolades all mixed in is really good. I I want to just say to your last point. Um, how do you incentivize people to contribute to a collective when all of their reward system comes through their agency in a very, it's almost obligatory, that it has to be stovepipe, you can't reward people for that collective effort. Um, that's one that people around the world grapple with. Um, we're not the only ones here. We dealt with it up in Puget Sound. Um, it really takes a camaraderie and the productivity that you showed here so that people can go back to their individual agencies and say, no, this really is good. But it's still, it's it's one that I think as a, for the ISB, we should pay some attention to that and see if we can help based on, especially on some of our experience in other systems, because that's a, that's a real profound problem. Yeah, if I can just follow up on that, I, I agree with Tracy there. One of the ways that is, um, uh, that everyone who publishes papers and they uh, realize that the best way to get a large number of publications is through a lot of teamwork. You may be the 27th author, but if, if that still counts, that still counts. And sometimes if an agency can recognize that um, uh, publications are your ways for promotion, and it doesn't really matter whether you're the first, second, or third author, uh, that will uh, sort of, if you can get the agency to do that, then you can then the individual scientists who uh, want to get promoted and want to get publications will by the very nature uh, go out and work in a collaborative way uh, but I don't know how you mandate that to, to different agencies yeah in my experience we've been extremely lucky in have sort of discovering people at the at key uh, program management levels who've who've enjoyed doing that and who've understood the value of doing that. But there's no requirement that that occur. And that's kind of my fear, um, you know, where we have that uh, and, and we do have that. And you've seen the evidence of that. It's, it's, it's wonderful. You know, I, I don't see the agencies adapting a mandate, any of the agencies adapting a mandate, except maybe the USGS, uh, for, you know, participation in, in research and publication and management relevant uh, technical memos necessarily uh, outside of what's useful within their own agencies. But as I said, we, we've been lucky. We've had program managers who recognize how valuable that is. And right now, you know, those people are, are supporting our efforts. But I'm not sure that that has, to, I, I hope that that's not, I hope that that's considered to be a fragile arrangement and that we do things to continue to bolster those efforts because this is a fragile arrangement. <laughs> you know, it's an MOU. Uh, the agencies don't have to do this stuff. I have 
a, a quick question. So, uh, you know, I've I've also been aware of IEP for for decades, and um, you know, one of the things that I see that's extremely valuable to it, particularly under uh, rapidly changing environmental conditions, is the long term value of the data that you've collected. So. Um, I, I know that there are challenges, and I know that uh, maybe the, the program has to evolve as we go further, but I'm curious to know how much appreciation there is for the value of that long-term record. Yeah, well, again, uh, this is my perspective, and it's, it's just my perspective. Um, among the science community, it couldn't be more valued. It couldn't be more... Uh, coveted, and it couldn't be more uh, an example of the way we should do things. It couldn't be more useful as an example of the way we do things. I mean, I consider Jim Clern and his colleagues to be, you know, my scientific uh, acolytes. You know, those are the people who I aspire to be, right? And and they're saying, and they have said for many years, this is what this data set is for. It's the basis of any sort of long-term evaluation of the direction and, and performance of the estuary, and you need that. And, and I, I bought into that. I mean, you know, you don't go to UC Davis and, not, and don't understand the value of even simple long-term data sets as the basis for your continuing and improving understanding. Um, so the scientific community values those almost above all else. Uh, I'll, I'll take criticism for that last comment, and that's fine. Um, but I'm not sure that um, agency directors feel the same way, because the criticism they're getting is, man, those guys go out and do 100 surveys a month for what? They're collecting nothing. They're getting zeros. Delta smelt aren't even in the nets. They avoid the nets, or things along those lines. And yet, they still collect delta smelt. There aren't very many delta smelt to collect that they collect 71 other species. And if we want to continue to tell people things about the estuary, some of those 71 other species are probably going to be the species we're going to use to do that. So I think it's a matter of communicating the value as opposed to challenging people about the value. Um, and, you know, they're always going to be detractors, um, but, you know, for 1.5% of the budget, um, are, are you serious? I just had a, a specific question. Um, one of your slides, you said that there was a mandate now to do a distribution study. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is? Uh, probably not. Um, I'm not a I'm not a, 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 a Win Act scholar, but that was an excerpt from the Win Act of 2016. It was I could I could go back and find the exact passage from which it's it's referenced. Or is that but, being done now? Or uh, yeah, well, so that is one of the one of the justifications and 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 um, rationale for and and funding for the uh, for the enhanced Delta Smelt monitoring program. Uh, specifically called out, and they said, you know, thou shalt do this. And, and again, I, I, I think it's uh, it's been a, a real eye opener for me uh, and for the IEP in general. I think in in you know educating us for alternative ways that we can get things done and collect additional information. Uh, but it's been a challenge to adapt to the demands that that program has has put on us because it's a lot more sampling, uh, and 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 that's just it. It's just a lot more sampling. Is it a uh, broad scale sampling geographic study? Is that the enhancement or is it uh, more detailed looking at diel and tidal cycles and inshore, offshore kind of thing? Or um, There are people here who could describe it in more detail. Uh, it's an explicit uh, acknowledgement that um, these things can be um, divided into strata in different ways. It's an explicit acknowledgement that um, uh, a randomized design should be the basis for where you pick where, where to sample. And it's an explicit acknowledgement that um, daily or at least bi-weekly, uh, but I think daily sampling, is, is really what you need. And you can't really get at it with uh, twice a month or monthly sampling. And all of those things, are, I think, are, are very true. I mean, I don't know that anyone has any issue with that. 
Um, but that's, 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 I believe, what was behind the language. They, they, they said, you know, I'm, I don't know how bills are actually made, but, you know, I, I suppose somebody said we need, you know, diel sampling, by, you know, daily randomized, and they said we can't put that in there and just put, you know, more and better. And that's kind of what you got. I mean, th that's what I know of legislation. <laughs> Um, th thank you very much, Steve. That was really a nice overview of, of a pretty complex beast. Um, it, we really exist in an era of problems that are, are more than any one agency can handle. And, and no one agency really has credibility and capability to address these issues. And many of these issues really require the technical expertise of, of many agencies and others often even people outside the agencies occasionally, to, uh, to provide the insights and, and the broad communication that you need to make the insights um, useful. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if IEP did not exist, that this board would probably recommend that it be coming into existence, um, although I'm not sure it would be exactly the same way. Uh, so, I, but, so I think it's, it's really a great institution, and certainly as I've been around here over decades now, even though I'm a modeler and I, I work more on the water supply side than in stuff in, in the ecology area, I've, I've certainly gone to my share of IEP meetings and, and, and listened interested, with interest to the annual reading of the entrails of, of what was read inside the <laughs> fish's stomachs. You know, it's, <laughs> and I've been frustrated often by the lack of insights that have come out or, or, or the, Maybe the insights were there, but I'm just too dumb to understand them and to appreciate them. And again, that comes to back to communication with, with, uh, with dumb engineers and things like that. I had a few specific questions for you, though. Um, two, what, what do you think is missing from IEP now? And how do you think IEP activities fit with the notion of a Delta Science Plan? Uh, the first, second one's easier. Uh, I think. I think we are easily the estuary's data collectors, particularly for fish resources and, and their food. Um, and I think we know how to do that, and I think we do that pretty well. And I think, um, you know, in pursuit of requirements for the biological opinion, um, you know, I, I think that's a, a, a sweet spot for the IEP. So I, I, I see the IEP as playing a, a you know, a similar role, regardless of the institutional arrangements and, and mandates, as you know, the on-the-ground data collectors for for the information needs that people have, with with supplementation. I mean, there's there's some things that are easily seedable to other people who do it well or better. Mm -hmm. And I think had you, I've made comments uh, to that effect at the directors recently, and I hope to write those up, and so maybe at some point the community can see those. But you know, there are places where, and this is what I said before. You know, IEP doesn't have to do it all, but I think we're pretty well situated to be doing a lot of it and and, and we've proven that we can do it mm -hmm. the the first part of that question is 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 much more difficult um, what's missing I mean um, you know I don't want to be I, I tend toward the flippant I don't want to be flip but I think one of the places where we've alighted recently and we've made a couple of I think important improvements in understanding is the synthesis portion of what's going on. Even if we're not collecting the data and presuming that we can get the data collectors involved in our discussions, which I think is vital to the synthesis effort, I think we have a real strong role to play and that we're not quite hitting on all cylinders yet in synthesis of this information and what it means for policymakers. And that feeds right into the science uh, communication piece that I'm, that I'm trying to maybe garner some support for and try and make some stabs at myself. The, you know, so there's, there's some really talented, you know, interdisciplinary people that we have available to us now, and they're just sort of hitting their strides within the, within the program, and they're making their first efforts at the drought synthesis and, 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 you know, trying to come up with what was the impact to the estuary of, you know, some big deal changes to the water and not project oriented, I mean, you know, climate oriented, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's really, I think it's really going to, going to blossom soon. Um, and I think 
you know, I made a request again at the director's meeting last month for six positions that would support synthesis in that effort. Um, we've got two or three now, and they're making good progress. The flash reports that you may be familiar with, the, the mast reports uh, that, that you may be familiar with, the pod report that many people here at this table can remember. You know, those were good examples of where you, you got some people to do the synthesis part, and we really made uh, credible improvements in our community understanding of many things. Maybe not amongst the scientists, because they sort of do that as a matter of course, but it, I think it filtered up to the policymakers in a, in a way that we hadn't really experienced before. And I think we're, we're, we're doing that now. So if I were to say what's missing right now, I, I would say maybe that synthesis piece, although we're making strides. The other thing is, you know, something that you guys are going to take a look at, and it's kind of the reason why I had that sort of that, that stair-step slide and the mountain of, of information that we're continuing to add on to our list. I think at some point it would be useful to have somebody stop, maybe us, and say, what is all this doing for us? Are there duplications? And, and, and not from a program standpoint, mm -hmm. from an information standpoint, you know. Uh, and we've had some of those conversations, but the institutional arrangement is difficult because even though you might see in the data that, well, this data set is duplicating this other data set, or there are gaps in this data set that this other data set could fill if it only went out on Wednesdays and didn't go out on Tuesdays. And we really haven't found a mechanism to have that discussion because you know you're talking about people's programs, and that's the way we've done it. And and I don't mean to put it in such ambivalent light there, but one of the things that was really interesting recently, um, and Ted and some others were involved, we we had a discussion uh, about a, a proposal for some uh, smelt resiliency strategy actions that might be being taken in Sassoon Marsh, and you know at the science management team level at the IEP the discussion very quickly got to, oh, you guys, here's the information I think I need for this project. What do you guys think? And immediately the response was, oh, man, we can help you with that because we're out there anyway. All we got to do is move down, you know, 100 yards and we'll nail your spot. And, it, and that was the kind of thing that um, I think you would discover if we were allowed to stop and say, look, forget your agency hat forget your program, forget to whom you're responsible as an agency, as a program manager in your agency, what are your data needs? And do they overlap or are there gaps? And we talk about that all the time, but we don't seem to be able to find the mechanism to so, get to that. So would that fit in as part of a planning, Delta Science plan process? I mean, could, can you imagine that fitting in yeah, underneath but that? Potentially, but that's pretty granular, right? Yeah, maybe it ought to be. Potentially. Steve, thank you very much. 